Well, good evening um, and welcome to this evening's Think In. Um, I'm Matt Dancona, I'm an editor at Tortoise Media. And first of all, can I say it's great to be back in Newcastle, uh, where half my family come from, but also where Tortoise has often been in the past. This is our first back on the road and it's fantastic. It, we, we felt very uh, trapped not being able to get out on the road because that's kind of what we do, you know, go out, meet people, listen to what they think and take those thoughts back to the office and try and work out what to do with them. Uh, and so as, I, as for everyone, the lockdown, the pandemic was was incredibly frustrating. We, we, we made do as everyone did on with Zoom and hybrid and what have you, but there's nothing to beat getting on a train and going somewhere outside of London, getting outside the London planet. So thank you all very much for coming. Um, we also welcome to people who are tuning in on Zoom. Um, and uh, my colleague, the great and mighty uh, James Wilson is um, in the room here and he will be monitoring the chat and he will keep us informed of questions and ideas and thoughts and input coming um, all the way through. So uh, please don't hold back with your thoughts. Um, just to give some background to that, I mean, we're talking about democracy and um, I write about politics. And one of the things that interests me is that people love democracy and hate politics, even though they're the same thing in theory. And that interests me because I think that there is still a yearning for a democracy that works, but a feeling that politics doesn't deliver it particularly well. And before um, lockdown, we were working on a project which we called The Rules, which was really just to kind of interrogate that and look at the problems between the centre, the great planet of London, and everywhere else in the UK. Uh, why, why was it that power was so unevenly distributed? But also to look at the power gap between people within communities. Why was it that people within communities often felt that the systems and institutions that they were part of didn't really work and weren't delivering the kind of accountability that they felt they had a right to, you know, just as citizens? And um, it's great to be able to resume that inquiry. And that, that's really what tonight is about, is getting that debate reignited. And, and, and I'm really hopeful that all of you will have things to say. And the, the, the canvas is extremely broad. Um, it, it's about what makes democracy work or rather how it could work better. Um, and, you know, what's working for you, what's not working for you in politics, locally, regionally, nationally on your on your doorstep you know do you feel a common theme we've found already o over the last three years of our existence is that many people now feel that being a citizen doesn't amount to much more than obeying the law and paying taxes and that something has been lost what is it and can it be retrieved um so very very lucky to have two fantastic speakers um and we'll be talking to them about their experiences and their ideas in this context, um, the wonderfully named Tom Rathwell, who's <laughs> director of across the UK strategy at the BBC, uh, which is a fantastic initiative, which we'll talk with him about. And the equally wonderfully named Jackie Cartwright, <laughs> who is a project worker at the Kinship Care Organization. And I look forward to hearing uh, Jackie talk about, uh, I was lucky enough to talk to her just before the meeting about some of the work she does and it's, Absolutely fascinating, and I hope we can explore that. But also, very much to, to, to you all, um, the sooner you chip in, the better. Oh, we've only got an hour. So um, let, let me start with you, Tom. Um, um, I mean, first of all, t tell us about uh, across the UK. What is it? How can it help some of the problems that I've mentioned already? And how do you see it? Sort of, how do you see it fitting into a, a post-pandemic strategy, both for the BBC but for the UK more generally? Uh, well, that's a big question, Is but um, there, I know. <laughs> so um, it's a little bit of a difficult job title because across the UK, it just sounds very corporate. Um, effectively, what we're looking to do as the BBC is to move more spend out of London and the M25, and and that is a combination of jobs created. But importantly, real creative spend, programming, and and decision making around how we commission programming, and um, it's because we know the BBC needs to do more, 
and we think the BBC can do more and we're being targeted about how we do it. There are some really big numbers. In, in TV terms, it's, it's not as much as it needs to be, but um, effectively my work will mean that by the end of the current charter period in 2027, 2028, um, the BBC will spend an additional £700 million outside of London on programme making um, with particular focuses in different parts of the country where we think there is underinvestment, but also where the BBC has some real audience challenges. And um, I'm only here, actually, because I was in Newcastle anyway tonight because uh, we are working a lot with all of the local authorities across the Northeast. We're investing £25 million over the next five years in local production across the Northeast. Um, I'm really proud of it. It's not before time. It's not going to be enough, the BBC just spending this money. We need to bring others in, independent producers, broadcasters, streamers, to do more here. But we think the BBC can take the lead. And um, it's about making sure ultimately the people that pay for the BBC feel more represented and have content across our services, which is more relevant to their lives. So ultimately they feel they get better value from the BBC. Um, and through that process, we create jobs, economic impact, growth, and we hope that everyone will win from that. So uh, hopefully that's a more accessible explanation about so what I'm doing. It's, it's fascinating what you say, Tom, because it's, it, there's a kind of duality here, isn't there? Because on the one hand, the BBC is, and proudly, a national and global organisation. And, and we were just chatting before, before thinking about those uh, first months of lockdown in which there were moments when it held, felt like the country was held together by iPlayer and Bite Size. And I exaggerate, but, but it, it really was a, a moment when I think the BBC was a kind of point of collective identity. But on the other hand, the BBC also has to be um, genuinely local. And it's a time when we know that um, some of the traditional forces of local accountability, notably the local newspapers, are you know, in, in deep and often terminal decline. So how do you manage that, that duality? Um, I should really get Tim along to, to answer that question, but- um, Well, you, we've got you. You never, you never quite manage it. It's, it's a balancing act. And um, there'll be some that will welcome the BBC's activity in the Northeast, and there'll be some that perceive it to be a threat and competition that is not welcome. I think we, we're behaving as an organization differently to the way we behaved even 10 years ago. We know we operate in a global market. We know even as a national broadcast, we're not big enough to compete effectively with a Netflix or a, a platform. Um, we need to work together like never before. Um, and we feel that the way we're working at the moment, whether it's in journalism with the local democracy partnership or through production partnerships like in the Northeast or in the West Midlands, um, the BBC can really still lead change. And I think it's our role as an institution that serves the public to be seen to be doing that, but also be clear that it's not just the BBC that is accountable and responsible for leading this. Um, there's a role from national governments, from partners. And I think if, if there's one positive thing that, well, it's the most rewarding thing of my job is working with people from across boundaries, right? And, and I, think, I think some of the challenges that we have now in terms of reaching people and, and also investing properly and, 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 and creating growth is that we have to work together and we have to put historical rivalries aside because actually, if we don't work together, we all lose, right? And I think... I think that is probably the biggest shift that I've seen in my career at the BBC in the last two, three years, is that realisation that we've got to get out. We've got to get out of London. We've got to work with Teesside, Wearside, Tyneside authorities. We've got to work with independent producers and we've all got to kind of commit to a shared vision for, for, how, we, for how we change this region and, and other parts of the country. Um, and I think that's a real change from, from, from us as an organisation. And do you feel, because I mean, one of the, the themes that 
even before the pandemic and then during it came up again and again and again for us was people feeling they've they've lost agency they've lost uh, accountability they've they've lost um i mean the, the the brexit slogan they've lost control they've lost control all over their lives and particularly the accountability and i wonder is there a, it, it, it does it become a more is there more of a burden on the bbc now to be that force of accountability in 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 the regions um in a way that you know it perhaps uh, it's always aspired to but perhaps now even more it has to be um I don't think it's ever gone away. Yeah, no. I, I, I think we're always accountable and we should be accountable. We receive a significant amount of public oh, I mean, money. You, you holding others to account. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, we, we feel we feel proud of the role that we, we play in that. And, and we see that in the response from the audience in terms of consumption of, of local news bulletins. You know, that's one of the top five best performing TV titles across the whole schedule, right? So we see nationally there is an appetite for the BBC's role in, in providing that accountability. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't quite know how to answer the question. I mean, it's, it's a big, it's a big, a it's question, a big yeah. driver of, of, of what we do. I think, um, but it's more than just us. And actually the role that we're playing now is about building capacity, building appetite. So we will work with other news organizations to build um, media literacy because actually an understanding and critical thinking across the country is really important, whether you can see in BBC News or social media. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge part of what we do, um, but it's never enough for some people. Like we're in the middle of a, quite a turbulent environment. Some people think we go too softly on politicians and and people in positions of responsibility. Some people think think the opposite. So, um, yeah, we just my job is just to do do what I keep think going. is best and keep going. Yeah. You talked about collaboration, which is um, obviously very important. But one of the interesting things about the last twenty years has been something that I don't think people in 2000, I certainly didn't see coming in 2000, was that technology would become, um, and algorithms would become great dividers and make it, put people into echo chambers and silos, and that it would be that much harder than it had been before to, to, to collaborate, you know, to, to talk in a civil way. And, you know, the, the I remember Tony Hall, the former Director General of BBC, always used to say that, the algorithm was the problem. You know, the, the algorithm is as the sort of symbol of, of of the way that much of the world was now working, which was that you were, the BBC was a public service broadcaster and it, and governed by, you know, val traditional values in a modern setting. But the algorithm that was operating in, on lots of other platforms was driving people away from points of contact and civil discourse and. So how much of your work is, is I mean, not, I don't mean, you know, fighting Twitter, because that's Elon Musk's problem, not yours, but um, mm. uh, is there a consciousness that the context ha has become harder in that respect? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, the challenge of our times. Like I, yeah. I, I think, um, we play a, we play a huge role in terms of that driving that national accountability. But I think part of the challenge, and and this comes to the kind of theme about democracy, is is how do the forces that shape our lives how are they held accountable? And a lot of the platforms are these invisible forces that that play a huge role in people's lives. And I'm not going to get into the debate of whether they're a good or a bad thing. No, I think but they're just there. Like, they're there. They? They're there. But regulating them, policing them holding them to account is a difficult process. And I think that I think is the th is probably when we look back on this period of history will be the point in which the role of government changed somewhat, because I think there's, there's, there's a, there's a process we're going through, which is about how we, how we regain control over our lives. Right. And I think we were talking about leveling up. I don't really like the term, but it's this, the reason why it's now such a big political theme is about correcting the imbalances that 
exist economically across the country, but also how they drive outcomes and opportunities for people. And in some respects, that's a reaction to the structural changes that have gone on in the economy for the last 20, 30 years around globalization. In terms of the algorithm, that's almost like the next wave. It's the kind of internet wave, which we're still trying to find the answers to. I think the role the BBC plays is that um, we, we measure ourselves on impartiality. We have platforms. We have a very range of programming where we encourage debate. Um, I spent a huge amount of my BBC career in radio. I think it's still the original convener of debate because you can pick up a phone, you can participate. There's there's very few barriers to, to, to getting involved. But I think in digital, the BBC hasn't quite got there yet. Um, and I'm not sure what it will take to get in, to, to get a level footing to some of these big platforms or even whether it's the role of a regulator to to kind of bring them back into yeah. into into the into a le more level playing field i don't know but huge question um, yeah <laughs> yeah um thanks so we will certainly be coming back to you lots um jackie welcome thank you so much for joining us welcome. tell us a bit about kinship because it seems to me that um any definition of democracy that's worth having includes a, an idea, some idea at its core of decency and the interaction of the state and voluntary sector to achieve that goal. And again, we only need to look at some of the terrible statistics that have been flying around in the last couple of months about what's already happening and what lies ahead to realise that you know, basic standards of decency in the social contract are at best imperiled and possibly already broken. Yeah. So tell us about your work and, and, and how that sits within that. Well, first of all, can I just say I am a kinship carer and a volunteer. I'm sorry. Than, I than, a, than an actual worker. Uh, but I do do quite a lot with the kin The kinship charity is basically the only charity that um, supports kinship carers. There's none of the other children's charities really know anything about it. And they sort of... Um, evolved from Grandparents Plus um, and then changed the name so it included, because Kinship Care is um, family and friends, family and close friends. So it can be siblings or aunties, uncles, majority of grandparents. Um, so Kinship in this area have actually had to set up support groups peer-to-peer um, -peer support groups, which were then constitutionalised. So it was a pilot scheme up here, so we were quite lucky. They did at the time also have a one-to-one -one befriend scheme, but that the funding ran out for that. Um, I think now it's, um, it's sort of spreading. It's a very small charity for a national charity. It's quite small with not a lot of money. Um, and a very small office and a very small staff, which yeah. has grown at the minute. Um, I think because kinship, yes, is a postcode lottery, because it does depend where you live, mostly um, because there aren't any regulations around kinship care, unlike foster care, adoption. You know, these children often come in the middle of the night with nothing and you don't know they're coming. Um, and you when know, it, do they come via a website or via a phone? No, no, it's normally, um, well, nine times out of ten through social services. Through social services, right. Um, so there might already be problems in the family, there yeah. might not be. Um, we've had grandparents who didn't know there was a problem with their grandchildren until it turned up on their doorstep in the middle of the night in the clothes that they were wearing. Um, others, in our case, we knew there was problems. Right. And with hindsight, maybe we should have guessed. But we just got a visit one day when actually we, we've got twins. Um, they were actually at our house and the social worker came and said, right, they can't go back with their parents. We want them to stay here. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, OK, then. yeah, fine. Uh, and after that, it's just... Bit of a moment. It's a bit of a moment because there's only guidelines um, and a law... The local, all local authorities are expected to look at families first. Yes. They do it in a way that's not um, moral, really, because what they start off with is sort of a lot of nonsense. 
Um, you know, I, I can only talk about our example, but it was like, we want these children to stay here. We've told the parents, if they don't agree, we'll get a court order, so they're staying with you anyway. We'll then um, assess you as foster carers. Right, okay then. So, you know, your head's sort of spinning a bit. And then two days later, another social worker comes in and says, oh, that's not a route we promote. Okay, I didn't ask for it, you know, mm. so what happens? And they then go on to sort of basically um, force you into getting an order. Not force, but, but it's sort of a daily, are you going to get an order? Are you going to get an order? Are you going to get an order? We'll write a report. In our case, the, we didn't get any help with legal fees. Um, they wrote a support and report which they handed to me the morning of the court case, but they didn't come to court. Um, I did have a lady a month before that at the final child protection meeting tell me it was um, a question if I was committed to these children, by which time we'd had them 11 months. That's quite a... It, as evidence goes, I would say that's quite... quite yeah, a and evidence. I was sort of... I think that was the first time I really got annoyed. And, yeah, you know, I'm sort of like, surprised. I've turned my life upside down. Yes. My daughter has started secondary school with two screaming babies, what do you call commitment? Yeah. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a familiar story. And because I was now nearly 23, it's a little bit worrying mm. that we're still hearing the same stories. Um, a lot of local authorities use emotional blackmail. We were told that because they were twins, they probably wouldn't be together. They certainly wouldn't be in Newcastle because there was no places. Um, but if that's the way we wanted to, we could just go and visit them. And do you think... <laughs> so, you've seen this, deck. I mean, is this... What's going on here? Is this um, uh, a, an overload and, and kind of overlapping of too many regulations, too much red tape? Not enough regulations. Not enough regulations? No. Not enough... Regu no regulations. No regulations. Basically, okay. because at the moment... The suggestions. Right, well, that's. So sometimes it depends what side of the bed they got out um, in the morning as to what's going to happen. There's no actual regulations that this local authority has to do this or this one has to do that. There's a few authorities in the country who are pretty good. Uh, Leeds is very good, apparently. Um, they, they treat everybody the same. In the northeast, um, if people have a special guardian's order, they tend to get a little bit of financial help, but it's only for two years. Right. And then you're on your own. Um, and that's region specific, though, is it? That's that is region specific. Yes. Um, it seems to be an SGO's. The sort of latest. It was actually brought in. There was no such thing when we got it, and it was brought in as a. Um, it was an extra for people who were having problems mm. with the birth parents because you left to manage contact, um, things like that, which... That in itself is quite a big... That in itself is massive. Lift. We were left with supervised visits to be supervised by us, but it was up to us what happened because there was no contact order put in place. So they're delegating to you yeah. something that would normally be quite a tense and, you know, big part of their role, correct? Yes, exactly. So really what it is, is I, I think the local authorities think they're cost cutting, but in actual fact they're <laughs> not. Because if they actually supported the kinship carers, we don't need what foster carers have. We don't need a social worker for the child, a social worker for the foster carer, an extra worker to make sure that everything's happening right, a social worker to take them to contact. We don't need any of that. But you're... But you're, you do need some sort of regulation to speak But some process. kind of regulation. The... Um, the Independent Care Review was published yesterday, um, which is a review into yes, all yeah, children's yeah. social care. And the suggestions in that, for the first time ever, kinship care has been recognised. 
and reading the report, it sounds like kinship care's actually sort of been chosen to prop up the system, um, which it actually already is. There are actually more kinship care kids than foster kids. Really? Yeah. And that's the ones we know about. Right. Because, but before they've just been like hidden. It's like they're, they're inconsequential, if you like. They don't matter. Um, and what, what gets hard is, and you don't even realise it when they're little, like I said, our two are 23, they've both gone to uni. And you then get to the position of, you can't tick that you're a care leaver because they don't acknowledge you as a care leaver. So you can't get a care leaver's bursary. I see, right. A foster child is entitled to be supported in education till yes. 25. Uh, my granddaughter's best friend is a foster child who has just done a nursing degree. Brilliant, great. Yeah. She got all her accommodation paid for. She got the care leavers bursary. She lived in a beautiful student accommodation. And then you're looking at your child and she's saying, I do love her, but why does she get why? all that? Yeah. It's not all about money, I have to say. No, sure. Um, we've recently, with a campaign, um, we've got a regional <laughs> campaign, a national campaign going now. We've actually, for the first time, got Newcastle um, social services to engage. And we've, we've had a Zoom meeting, and we've, we're going to have a face-to-face -face one as well. <laughs> so we had the assistant director of social services. And it, it, it just sort of... You actually wonder if they know a lot of things or if they really don't know some things. We, we used to, the case of a lady who comes to our support group who has three severely traumatised children. At the minute, they're, I think they're 15, 12 and 8, so she's had them three years. They have actually let her go under the foster care route. But when she started coming to our support group, they were pushing for her to actually get the SJO for them. And as soon as she came into the support group, she was saying, oh, yeah, I've been to see the solicitor. And he said, oh, yeah, that's the right thing to do, blah, blah, blah. Because most solicitors know nothing about kinship care. And it was like one voice. Everybody went, don't. Don't even do it. And she was like, no, 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 the social worker said. And I went, the social worker works for you. Nobody else. Because, and the biggest thing is we're telling this story and this assistant director said, oh, well, that'll be for the allowance then. And I went, actually, no. This is because these three children are going to really need mental health services. They really do. And as a foster care child, you're up here on the list. Yes. As a kinship care child, you're here and probably have to go private eventually. Um, and she was sort of like... Oh, you're not talking about money because we've deliberately gone very grassroots on sure. these meetings as, as all we're asking for is like relevant information, not a load of codswallop, that's what you usually get. Sorry, <laughs> can't think of another word for it. But the other one was about the unis and I said, no, well, actually it was the college one. And I said, you know, for one of mine to get a £30 bursary towards bus fares, all I needed was a letter from the local authority saying this is a looked-after child. Can't get one. So Not a looked-after child. Who is... I mean, the question you always want to answer in these situations is, what, what's the lever I have to pull? Who do I have to call up? I mean, wh what's the level... You said it's very grassroots. I mean... You know, That's where we're going in on the on the um, regional one. So if you wrote a letter to Jamie Driscoll, would you get a reply? I have no idea. Because it's a very interesting, because there are lots of levels of We've of had contact. lots of MPs in who initially are very, or they say they're very interested, usually around about election time. <laughs> and then the justice right. appear. I think the top level to get the, the real thing um, and if this care review works, it's going to take regulation. Yeah. It, it's going to take legislation. But there's things that can be done before that. You know, things like giving people clear 
information is the first thing we've asked for, not we want you to get this order, please are you going to get this order? If you don't get this order, we could always take them into care. But to say, the, these, this is your, the, these are your options, and if you get a special guardian's order, this will happen, that will happen. It, it's as simple as that. And, and, and there, but you're also, it, what's interesting, Jackie, is you're talking about some basically common sense equalisations between those kinship and those in foster care that I think any normal decent person would say it's, it's obviously something that's yeah. an anomaly that needs to be rectified yeah um and what I imagine is is frustrating is that there is no obvious way of getting that sorted at the moment there's not no right um they have sort of sort of agreed um to produce a leaflet right and improve their website right and what was the other one <laughs> Oh, to train the social workers better. Yeah. But we already do part of that because some, uh, some of the volunteers and the kinship carers go into Northumbria Uni as experts by experience on the social work courses. I've done it. I did some of the week with assessments. And that's great, but not everybody who goes to Northumbria University is going to work in a Northeast authority. It, it's... I think it's a very hard question because a lot of it's going to have to be, the big things are going to have to be legislation. Yes. So sort of things like financial support. Obviously that has to be. Yeah. Um, I think convincing the local authorities that actually it can be done without a massive cost to them, that some things just are common sense. Yeah. I don't know why that can't be done. It, it basically, Newcastle's had a really bad reputation for engaging. Um, and this is the first time. The local authority is. Yeah, yeah, the local authority is. This is the first time we've managed to get them to engage. So we're sort of taking it as a, a little bit of a... A start. A start, yeah. yes. And we're, we're all going very gently with it at the minute. Um, I think the national campaign might be slightly different. Yes. Yeah. Because that's just starting. And that's on the back of the care review. The care review. Yeah. It'd be fascinating to see what happens. Um, do chip in. Uh, who who would like to? Yes. Hello. Thank you. Um, oh, hold on, sorry. Just waiting for the mic. Thank you. Um, two very different presentations, but to me they're both about um, accountability, politics um, and democracy. Because, you know, the, the BBC position, and I'm a great fan of public sector broadcasting, and I hope you retain the licence fee, I have to say. And it is value for me as far as I'm concerned. Um, but the issue about how do you get out of London and with respect, even when you have things done locally, there's still that imbalance of power and how you try and reflect that back up. And equally with Jackie, I mean, most of my working experience has been in the NHS and in um, charities. And I have been a local politician. And I think it sort of shows the, the lack of clarity over where do you go? Because as far as I understand, the North of Tyne Mayor doesn't have responsibility for social care. Um, there are some things which absolutely should be national. I mean, a child or a young person in Leeds or Newcastle should have exactly the same rights. I mean, yes. I think that's some things that should be done nationally. I think what we're seeing now with, with local democracy is local authorities have been hit so tight, and I think something between 60 to 70% of their spend, their available spend, is now in children's and adults' social care. And they're so frightened. Um, no one wants to be on the front of a, of a paper um, because of the issue of risk, but equally um, the, the rights and responsibilities of parents and carers and grandparents and the rights of the child have to be balanced. And I think that there is a confusion now over who is responsible and where do we go for things, and people don't know, and they are very, very confused. I mean, in this area we've got parish councillors, town councillors, city councillors, mayors, MPs, police authority, police and crime commission. Sorry, I could go on and on. And it, it, is, it is very, very confusing is about it accountability. Too, I mean, too, because, again, debates about democracy really often end up as debates about institutions, which is not the same thing. It's part of it, but it's not the same thing. And something you hear again and again is... Um, People say, well, would you like a regional assembly or would you like consultative assemblies? And they say, we don't want more layers of politics. What we want is systems that work. Yeah, I, I think clarity and responsibility, accountability and transparency so people know how things work 
I know where to go and what to do when things go wrong. And I think there is, you know, over the last 20 years, maybe rightly or wrongly, we've seen a growing um, mistrust of authorities, whether it's whether it's um, the police, whether it's medicine, whether it's a legal profession, whether it's communications, and you put that all into the mix and it's very, very dangerous. Absolutely, and, and, and what's also, I think, interesting is that, and you hear again and again, is that, um, it was interesting hearing Jackie say the, the, they were gonna do something about the website. And actually, often technology is a way of keeping people at bay because it's almost impossible now to get a human voice on the line for, for and not, and not just in the issues we're discussing, but generally. Mm. Um, and I, I think for a lot of people, um, that, is, that is, first of all, it's an affront, but also it's, it, 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 it removes any sense that you can actually get something done. And, and this, ray, this, ray, this is not just in public services, but everything. Um, the, the idea that a, a website is, a communicative tool is not always no. the case. We actually we actually had that with one of the team managers when we were on, and he, we said sort of it was me and a campaigns manager had tried to find kinship care on the website, and this team manager was saying, um, no, look, I found it, it's here, and I was like, yeah, but you know where it is. <laughs> and... If it had been when I first started, I would have had a baby in each arm. So where would I... Yeah, yeah, I know, exactly. Where and how and how long do you go on for? You just couldn't seem to get through. And I think you're sort of saying, the where do you, where do you go? Um, we've had this with the campaign thing, trying to work out where you raise the awareness. And we've gone down the road, we've gone, um, we're talking to a gentleman about social prescribing and things like that. So but you've got to know these things. It's only because we've managed to get a campaigns manager that we even know this. I wouldn't have known anything about it. I mean, I, 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 I've just listened to your story and it almost shock at some of the things you said. And I think there were some themes that jump out through what, what you said to me about consistency, fairness. You know, that is a really fundamental part of why there is so much disenfranchisement at the moment. People don't perceive themselves to have agency, that they're treated fairly, that they can hold people accountable. Um, we're, the BBC is not a campaigning organisation, but it has a responsibility to reflect local stories and local people's experiences. And through the process of our output, amplify them so that people find resonance and and the this this is the kind of story that actually our local news could cover and from what you just said about the numbers of children in kinship care yeah. versus foster care that's a national issue right there's there's other people going through similar issues to you that would find you know incredible comfort in having that national coverage, regional coverage, what it, however we do it as a broadcaster. So um, I'm not happy to hear the story, but I'm happy I'm here this evening to, to meet you and um, think about who I can, who you can talk yeah. to within, within our local radio now, and, and journalism it's, centre. It's not going to help me now, but I, it just concerns me that sort of 20 odd years later, we're still hearing the same stories. Sir, I think the problem is more profound uh, than you think it is, and especially with the BBC, actually. Um, I came to this, really, in my retirement uh, when I was chair of governors of a special school in Sunderland. It was a particularly good special school. I got to it not because I had any family there. It was because I was in Rotary and I knew the head teacher, and he invited me to be involved. And it, it, it was a most remarkable school. It was a most wonderful school. And uh, in the uh, flavor of the times, of course, is to close schools like this and to put kids into mainstream. Now, my education began there in my retirement uh, because there was a meeting of parents and the director of education came along and said, we've got a great news for you. We're going to close the school down and all the kids are going to have a right to go to mainstream schools. And a parent governor stood up and said, well, can we have a vote? 
Not one single hand went up in favor because in fact, all those kids were getting a wonderful education in that school. But the flavor of the times was inclusion, that the kids should go mainstream regardless of the consequences, because the people who believed in it, they believed it very quite profoundly believed in it, that it was a good thing for, ha for it to happen. But it was so good and so right that it should happen, they didn't need to think around possible bullying in mainstream schools, didn't think about whether the resources were gonna be there in mainstream schools. And the result is that in fact, uh, it, the, the, the case was loaded against the school. And did the school close? Well, now, actually, I won't go into this because I've written a book about it called Death of a Nightingale. And uh, I put a play on the, uh, on the stage about it uh, in order to try to make this point. Yes. Uh, because I think it's sufficiently important to try to make the point that, in fact, here you've got a clash of rights. The right of kids to go to mainstream school, which is obviously a right to go and have an opportunity to get to university, but the right of parents to have a choice of school for their kids. And what do you do when they clash? Now, it's this sort of problem that I, when, is relevant to your debate about does democracy work for you? Because my experience is that it doesn't work for you. That when you get a clash of human rights, which you get here, it doesn't work out on the basis of fairness or anything like that. It just happens to be who happens to be in power at the time. I was going to say, it seems to me that what that case illustrates, it, um, and we don't know the ending of the story, because of your creative, creative work, yes. which we look forward to reading. Um, but the, there's a power gap where you have a local institution that is working well and to the satisfaction of its uh, parents, and suddenly someone comes along and says, you're, you're going to get shut down. Now, that, that is, uh, that's an example of uh, not just a, uh, a clash of rights, but of, of a democratic deficit, because you have because you have a what Burke called a little platoon that is under attack from from an outside force. Well, all I can tell you in this instance, it was a very interesting. That's why I, that's why I got myself involved in it because it, it's a really interesting challenge. This one is when you think around it. I mean, the, that school. I mean, I, I had a uh, my contribution to that, apart from anything else, was to suggest to the parents they got reasoned objections to closure. Yeah. They got over 10,000 written reason objection to closure. And the minister, Charles Clark, closed the school, closed, sorry, the minister rejected the closure plans. But he didn't stop them trying to close the school. And in fact, the school is still there to this day, but it actually now caters for autistic kids. Right. And they're about to make, I believe on the grapevine, they're about to make the swimming pool, which was a most wonderful facility for kids with a physical disability, to regard that as no longer needed. So in a kind of a way, the establishment has won by virtue of killing the school's initial purpose. Um, but it's in a sort of a way the campaign succeeded because it could have just been a building site. Yes. Uh, so that it was a 60, it was, it was one of those things which, which everybody gets something out of it. But it, I'm much more interested in the whole situation here where you get a conflict of rights. And this is, I think, relevant to your subject, does democracy work? I don't think democracy quite knows how to deal with things when you get a conflict of rights. Right. At the moment, for example, on the roads, you've got rights of motorists, you've got rights of cyclists. How do you balance them out? Now you get some people saying, well, we've got an equal right to this or an equal right to that. But is it an equal right or just a right? I think it's a right, not an equal right. And then you need fair play to try to get the balance right between the one and the other. But that is not the way the argument works in this country. It works in a different way. And that's my experience. I don't want to, I could talk for ages on this. No, but I, I, think, I think you, you but, raise but, a very interesting point, which is the, the, the need to negotiate rights uh, when they come into conflict and also um, it's getting harder to find spaces where that can be done in a, in a civilised and, and non-polarised way. Well, the story I'll tell you about, the BBC were absolutely useless 
<laughs> sorry, the BBC never sustained the campaign. They actually reported the play, I'm pleased to say, A Death of a Nightingale, which was the name of the play, and the, the BBC London re reported it when it was performed in London. But after that, no debate at all on the subject, because the fact is it was a given that inclusion was the right thing in education, and nobody wanted to challenge inclusion and have a debate about what I'm talking about. Uh, they just remain silent. I'll come to you soon. I, James, what's going on in the chat? Tell us about what people are saying. Well, we've had a lot of exciting stuff in the chat going on. We had a big, big discussion on the BBC and what it can do to um, increase production and, uh, and reach across regions and feel like it was really catering to all of the UK. Um, they think the Channel 4 model does a really, really great job. Um, Charlotte has said that it's essential to build talent pools in different parts of the country and bring commissioning quotas um, and forcing senior staff to, or making sure that senior staff peril from London rather than just outsourcing. Um, she also thinks that COVID has helped a lot as meetings happening over Zoom have really leveled the playing field and uh, it's meant that production companies get more of a say from different parts of the country. Um, Ian Campbell raised the point that in Scotland, the BBC and media in general is too London-centric and BBC Scotland News is completely Glasgow-obsessed. Funding is cut every year and now the only thing worth watching is actually the BBC News from south of the border. Um, Charlotte says that in Tower Hamlets, on your point about institutions, technology mm -hmm. and whether they improve democracy, um, they've got a lot of digital exclusion, but the council is increasingly making all transactions online. Um, and she brought that into a, a wider point about local bodies and um, whether increasing the number of institutions locally would actually help connect people to um, to the way politics is done generally. So the key question is whether people have the time to engage and the resources to engage and feel that they actually can have an influence in events. Um, a real connection between people and those in power as opposed to what we currently have, which is a sense that people and corporations with money uh, are the ones with real influence on politicians. That's very really interesting. Thank you, James. So you had a... Point, I believe. Thank you. There's so many issues raised. <laughs> that's difficult to talk Well, have at it. <laughs> but um, one of the bigger question that we hit, that I, I thought we'd be discussing is um, this question of democracy working for us. And one of the key kind of dilemmas for me and my family and my work in film and television is um, long term as opposed to short term. And we have a uh, uh, it, we, I celebrate democracy and the democratic structure. We have this four or five year cycle. But in my experience of my own work in film and television, building something here in the region, it takes a long term commitment. You may be in post for <laughs> you know, 20 or 30 years, but um, my own experience, I heard on the radio yesterday that Channel 4 was launched 40 years ago. And uh, the Scotsman Jeremy Isaacs came to Newcastle and with a whole range of uh, government departments, we were able to build a training center. There were seven production companies, all were guaranteed work through Jeremy. And um, it was the beginning of an, it was the beginning of an opportunity in which people with experience, um, access to television, could train people, could give people an opportunity. So I moved 40 years forward I work principally now in the US, where there's a real welcome, an eagerness to find stories and to have a debate about these stories. What is important in the world? What's affecting you and your society and your community? BBC, which I, I fight the barricades, go to the barricades to defend the BBC. But when I think the division, so there's short term, long term, you have to build long term. But in terms of um, television, Often the debate falls into journalism and entertainment and sport, whereas drama and social media is a huge audience which we're losing to the world, to an Amazon and to Netflix and to Apple and to a variety of new uh, forms. Huge appetite, you know, six kids who are grown up kids now in their 30s and now grandchildren, that no one is watching television. They're all watching drama on social media an exchange of long form drama, which allows you to explore all these issues of health, <laughs> uh, society, democracy, 
there have been some extraordinary dramas in, in America over the last few years, principally by HBO, but other companies. Can I just ask, so where, so, where do your 30-year-old... No, because this is absolutely right in the... This is the, if you like, the belly of the beast, the question, which is, where do your kids get their news from? They, they all listen to uh, your initiative, this... Uh, well, they, they sound great. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I like them all. Please yeah, send them all, my very best. All, you know, they're all, you know, you know, they're fantastic, you know, privileged all these kids who are doing really interesting things. But they're not necessarily typical of, you know, a privileged family. Many, many people up here, I live in Northumberland, work in London, and the community around me has no voice whatsoever through the BBC or through you know, local, local political or central government. We have no voice at all. It was where you, your, your opening remarks were. Yeah, well, we I'm fascinated real by this. Dis but in drama, this kind of this sense of a place in society, our world, our future, where are we be in 10 or 15, 20 years? And, and you're, you're absolutely and, right. And there's you know, nothing I mean, there. There's nothing on our some, Something extraordinary has happened in yeah. America with yeah. prestige yeah. television. Yeah. Now, Tom, <laughs> what, um, what do you reckon? Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I mean, look, I, I agree with you on the long-term position. I think one of the reasons why I'm really proud that we're doing this work in the Northeast is because of the license fee as, as a method of funding. There's a lot of debate about it, but the £25 million we put in is for the duration of this charter. And if we had a longer charter, we might have well made a longer commitment. Um, we're really clear that this is a long-term endeavour for the North East. This will not be solved by the BBC. We need Channel 4 in the region. We need ITV to make more than Vera in the North East. <laughs> and, that, that, that's not, no, and that's not a slight to ITV, because frankly, without ITV making Vera for several series now, there would not be any base at all to build from, right? There is some good experience here. Um, but 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 you're right, you know, it does require a shared long-term vision with lots of money and lots of people pushing in the same direction. I think I think we do have a chance. The partnership we've signed is with all 12 local authorities and three mayoral authorities across the region, covering red, blue, industrial rivalries that have lasted 100 years that are now in translated to sport and all sorts of different aspects of this region which are brilliant but actually historically have inhibited cooperation um, but we need to work hard to bring others in we do need the streamers in Sunderland or Hartlepool making big budget drama because they will provide money and they'll provide trainee opportunities just like the BBC will but at a different scale and together we will build that cluster that I think someone on, on, on the comments talked about. We need a cluster of effort here um, and, we, and we'll get there. In terms of the regional voice and the local voice, I, I don't quite know how to answer that question. I'm not sure, part of me thinks, has that always been the case? And actually has it been the emergence of social media and hyper-local news that have made people aware of the limitations of legacy media platforms and um people now do use facebook and websites and apps like next door to find out what's happening in their street and that is a level of detail that it's difficult for the bbc to provide you know that voice at a super local level i think there's a question for us in terms of actually how do we use our platforms is there a way of opening up our platforms to have more debate and and to provide users with the ability to reflect their locality via our services, possibly. Um, that has been a front in terms of the responsibilities of platforms versus licensed regulated media. Um, and there are costs to that and benefits to that. And um, again, that's an area that I probably shouldn't get into tonight because that's not what that's my specialism is. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I, I think we're doing our best, but we need to work with other people who share our vision for, 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 for the UK. Thank you, Tom. We're hurtling towards the end of the hour, but uh, I'd like to, I mean, you, Ellen, if I may. I mean, this is probably a complete tangent to most of what's been good. discussing. Good, we like tangent. Tangents are good. <laughs> but just picking up me, the idea about democracy, I mean, I, my work is in health and I 
you know, I think you talk about disenfranchisement, and I think there is a huge issue. There, nobody is talking about massive, massive health inequalities between, you know, somebody like me, I, I'm about to retire, I can expect to be healthy for another 15 years probably. My patients, I'm seeing women younger than me, they've had strokes, they've had heart attacks, they're on half a dozen medications. And who, who's talking about this? And there is this complete message now that it's all individual responsibility. If you're not healthy, it's your fault because you smoked or you drank too much or you didn't eat the right foods. And it's completely missing a huge thing that it's the structure of our society. People need, you know, we were talking before about things that need to be done from the top. This is, it's completely, it's completely missing. I mean, you're talking about democracy, but what's democracy coming out and casting a vote? If you then are operating the whole rest of your life within a society that is set up to make some people healthy and wealthy and well, and other people unhealthy and poor, no wonder they're not interested in, you know, c coming out to stick a vote in a ballot box. Thank you. Please uh, jump in before the end. Thank you. I just want to talk about the access to democracy. So yes. pick up on a point that somebody spoke of before that, you know, quite often, you know, if, if you ring certain local authorities, you might be confronted with a telephone system that might take you a long time to get through. The point I want to make was that the time is a real factor for people. Yes. Maybe 20 years ago, that might have been a knowledgeable person that you spoke to the first time who would get you to the right person or department straight away. Or well, they and transferred that, you to the fraud squad yeah. and, and the line went dead. Yeah, quite. <laughs> um, and, and I think local democracy is, is, is perhaps not the only thing that that affects, um, okay. but it's, it's the same with um, you know, access to other uh, aspects of those services. So. Thank you. Um, alas, I'm going to have to, um, we, we've run over the hour already, um, but the main thing I want to say actually in drawing this to a close is thank you. Um, yesterday at about this time I was scrolling through Twitter and reading um, mind-melting arguments over whether a man holding up a glass of scotch surrounded by bottles and lots of other people drinking was a party or not. And I, I have to say I felt rather depressed about the state of democracy at that point because uh, I know a party when I see one, uh, even if I wasn't there. Um, and, and, but tonight I've been lucky enough to, to, to be involved in a proper debate about what democracy is and the, what I take away um, is that it's broken, but it doesn't have to be. And I think that we've heard some, and very, very grateful, Tom, thank you for, for, for leading the conversation, because I think in, 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 in the different spheres of activity that they occupy, it's, we've see, we see um, there, are, there are themes that emerge. Quite, it's like the tide pulling out and you see the seashore and, 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 and what lies at the seabed, and, and actually there are, there are things that, that we can identify. Um, uh, well, what's interesting is, is, is no one wants more politicians. So people in London who sit around devising more institutions are completely barking up the wrong tree. I think that what everyone wants uh, in the whole of the world, probably not just the UK, is uh, systems of, of communication that work, um, to your point, and, and, and you know, the whole question of digital access um, being both a problem but also a barrier. And I think, I suspect sometimes a, a deliberate barrier it is very hard. It's not just that people, it's unfair to people who, why should they, um, for all sorts of reasons, don't have full digital literacy. But even for those who do, you know, the, the message is we don't really want to talk to you. We, we really don't want, although the website is covered with things saying we want to hear from you and, you know, you can speak to a bot if you press the right button. I don't think they do. And I think this is actually a very significant issue in, 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 uh, as we move forward. Um, I think Jackie's point about regulation that works is going to be something that runs through all of this, which is there, you know, there were, you mentioned some really striking anomalies and they obviously need to be corrected. And the question is how, you know, how quickly can we get the, that done? I think Tom's point about boundaries and the need to cross them and to, to um, uh, have 
conversations that, that really count with people you disagree with. Um, 30 years ago, that would have sounded like a cliche. Now it, sounded like, it sounds like a, rep, a, 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 a rebellious and mutinous statement. It's, it's a genuinely revolutionary statement now because that is not how we are acting at the moment as a society. So it's fantastic to hear that that's you know, part of your mission, Tom, in the BBC. And, um, and also the gentleman's discussion about the, the clash of rights, I think, is so important. And the, the, the negotiation of that, I think, in, in all sorts of ways is going to be fundamental to this. And, and it applies in the case that you outlined, but also in many other areas. Um, and finding, again, a civilised way to negotiate those inevitable clash of rights happen in any pluralist society. Fascinating, too, to hear about the short term and the long term, because, you know, if you look at the problems that face our democracy, most of them actually are long term, but our methods are becoming more and more short term. Um, I read a terrifying statistic the other day that uh, in, I think, 2012, um, according to um, analyses, the human brain uh, lost, fell below goldfish in terms of its attention span because we've become, because we've become so, uh, basically because, of, I mean, to, to cut a long story short, because of social media and digital, the digital world. Um, it's just a picture of tortoise now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the great thing about tortoise is that we, uh, you know, we do the long term, you know, we are <laughs> unapologetically into the long term, so there's no, uh, but also, um, uh, just finally, the, the point you made about health that um, unless we acknowledge our duties to one another as, as, as human beings, um, and unless we come out of that, these terrible two years with a sense that a democracy that, 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 that is worthy of the name treats all its people, regardless of their personal histories and, and their backgrounds and who they are and how they've eaten and whatever, as, as human beings and treats them decently and gives them good quality world-class care, um, we don't deserve to call ourselves Democrats. Um, so, so much to do, uh, a daunting task, but let us begin. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we look forward to coming back.